They call it the granddaddy of them all. While the original Starcade was hardly the first professional wrestling supercard, its name endured, becoming the sort of annual destination that promoters and bookers anchor their calendars with. To kick off the Starcade timeline in 1983, Jim Crockett Promotions intended to have the NWA World Heavyweight Champion drop the 10 pounds of gold to a younger star, a torch passing from the established old guard to the ace of the next generation. Champion and challenger were each masters of their craft, and the months of build to the title fight had been impeccable. The only thing that could ruin this historic encounter would be if someone with more than a little sway managed to steer the champion away from doing the honours. months before the very first WrestleMania beamed out from Madison Square Garden, Crockett booked the very first Starcade to be held on Thanksgiving night 1983 at the Greensboro Coliseum and broadcast before a regional closed circuit viewership. An eight match card was assembled to showcase the top stars and most compelling angles from the territory, leading to a main event designed to set the table for the NWA's future. Among the three championship bouts was a title versus mask showdown, matching up reviled television champion The Great Kabuki against the mysterious Charlie Brown from Outer Town, who was actually a barely disguised Jimmy Valiant. Kabuki had sent Valiant packing that summer in a loser leaves match, leading to Valiant's return under the mask, which did nothing to hide his signature features, though the audience merrily played along with the gag. Kabuki wanted to prove that the hooded intruder was indeed the Boogie Woogie Man, and wagered his belt against Brown's mask. And if Brown was revealed to be the previously exiled Valiant, then Valiant would be suspended from the NWA for one whole year. Also at stake were the NWA Tag Team Titles, pitting champions Jack and Jerry Briscoe against two men that they'd turned on earlier in the year, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. That match would have former wrestling star and gridiron great Angelo Mosca as guest referee. In what promised to be an especially brutal encounter, United States champion Greg the Hammer Valentine was set to wage war with a man he'd battered in grisly fashion months earlier, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Valentine had won the championship from Piper that spring after using the ring bell to badly gash Piper's ear, leading to a referee stoppage. This rematch wasn't for the championship, however, as all Piper had in his sights was revenge. Thus, the two were linked at the next by a large, unforgiving chain in what would become a legendary dog collar match. While the undercard looked plenty captivating, most of the focus was on the dramatic build-up to the evening's main event. The NWA world title was up for grabs in Starcade's finale. Its champion was an NWA institution, the bellicose and unyielding Harley Race. At the time of the encounter, Race was in his seventh reign as an NWA World Champion and had recently passed his 40th birthday. The proud and boastful Race was still very much the greatest wrestler on God's green earth that he'd claimed to be, and had the hardware to prove it. For a challenger, Race was opposed by the very man he'd won the title from that June, 34-year-old Ric Flair. The Nature Boy went on to build a world title count that might comfortably number well into the 20s depending on one's interpretation, but at this point, Flair was merely a one-time champ. He defeated Dusty Rhodes for the gold in somewhat unceremonious fashion in September of 1981, and if you don't count the three ensuing phantom title switches that occurred outside the mainland US, went on to reign as NWA champ for 21 months. While Flair today is revered as an undisputed legend and irreplaceable figure in pro wrestling lore, the truth is that his first world title run was far from a smashing success. The seemingly random title win over Rhodes kicked off a reign that didn't fully cement Flair as an unquestioned top guy. Not every promoter on the NWA board of directors was enamored with the choice of Flair as champion, with some feeling he was too small or too unestablished to carry the torch. 
Fans in certain territories didn't warm to the upstart champion so easily back then, which Flair acknowledged, later writing, If the fans weren't interested in my opponent, we weren't going to draw money. When Race defeated Flair for the championship in June of 1983, the idea was to have Flair win it back in grand fashion. After months of build to come, Flair would defeat the long presiding race before as large an audience as possible, firmly crystallizing him as the man. There was apparently some reluctance at first from board members who still didn't see it with Flair, and even from Race himself. Ultimately though, everyone got on board with the plan, and the build to Starcade kicked into high gear through the summer months. In untelevised bouts throughout July, Flair proved unsuccessful in world title rematches, either defeating Race by disqualification or going to double countouts with the grizzled stalwart. The idea with these narrow escapes was that Race feared Flair had his number, and eventually sought to have him taken out of the equation. With that, Race offered a $25,000 bounty to anyone who could eliminate Flair, putting the pesky challenger out of wrestling permanently. In late August, Flair was battling Race for the championship and had the title holder snared in his figure four leg lock. That's when he was suddenly attacked by two men, Dick Slater and Bob Orton, the latter of whom had been portrayed as one of Flair's best friends. Money truly was the root of all evil, as Slater and Orton waylaid Flair with a vicious spike pile driver, and the toll looked to be severe. Selling a serious neck injury from the attack, Flair subsequently retired from wrestling, spurring a jubilant race to pay out the promised 25 large to the assailants. But weeks later, as Slater and Orton competed in tag team action, a neck brace wearing Flair stormed the ring, wielding a baseball bat. After running off both mercenaries, an irate, emotionally charged Flair made it clear that he wasn't done after all, and promised Race that he was coming for his precious championship. The match was set for Starcade. Race vs Flair for the World Heavyweight title to be contested inside of a steel cage, with former NWA and AWA World Champion Gene Kaniski presiding as guest referee. Two years after Flair's first world title victory underwhelmed, fans were rapidly anticipating the Nature Boy making this trek back down the Golden Mile and exacting brutal revenge en route to his triumph. But would the champion show up? Less than three months before Starcade, World Wrestling Federation owner Vince McMahon withdrew his territory from the National Wrestling Alliance, shortly after a highly contentious row at the annual NWA convention in Las Vegas. Applying the term territory to the WWF at this point, however, was an exercise in antiquated thought, as McMahon had already begun making the moves to take the WWF national. Dropping his allegiance to the NWA was but a formality. Onward and outward, the New York-based World Wrestling Federation roamed, promoting events in Ohio that October, with St. Louis and Detroit joining the touring circuit before the year's end. It wasn't just territorial boundaries that McMahon unflinchingly crossed. He began signing up the best and brightest stars from around those territories to work exclusively for the WWF. Before 1983 came to a close, the likes of Paul Orndorff, David Schultz, Dick Murdoch, and Mean Gene Okerlund all debuted for McMahon, while the Iron Sheik, Adrian Adonis, and other names that passed through in prior years were settling into McMahon's domain for the long haul. This was merely the first wave of fortifications that bolstered the WWF and showed the other promoters that McMahon's goal of national expansion was a deadly serious one. The biggest name to pledge loyalty to Vince was, of course, Hulk Hogan, who began his rise to the role of WWF Superman shortly after Christmas. In fact, Hogan was actually scheduled to wrestle at Starcade, as promotional materials seemed to indicate. He was supposed to team with Wahoo McDaniel in a match against Slater and Orton, the two men that decided cold hard cash was more important than Flair's well-being. As Wahoo was one of Flair's closest allies, you could say that an ascending Hogan was kinda sorta fighting to get revenge for Flair, which feels weird given the history they'd eventually make together. But Hogan didn't show for Starcade due to his participation on a tour for New Japan that same week. Some say that Hogan was never officially booked for the event and that his appearance in promotional materials was premature, but no matter, he wasn't there and was replaced in the match by Mark Youngblood. Another wrestler on the show would have been much harder to replace, and McMahon damn sure knew it. That's why he had designs on keeping the NWA World Champion out of Greensboro. Sometime amid a battery of title defenses that autumn throughout all Japan and the Florida and Central States territories, Race was summoned to New York to meet with Vince McMahon himself. It didn't take very long for McMahon to lay out his grand offer. 
If Ray skipped Starcade and brought the NWA World Heavyweight title to the WWF, McMahon would pay him $250,000. As Dave Meltzer later wrote, the plan was for Race to quickly drop the title to the inbound Hogan, who would then win the WWF title, unifying the two belts of considerable lineage. It would have been a devastating blow to the NWA and a masterful gain on the part of McMahon. So much was riding on Race's presence in Greensboro on Thanksgiving night. To legitimize Flair, he needed to beat Race inside that steel cage. There could always be other ways of crowning a new champion, but if Flair didn't win it from the champion himself, the man he'd been gunning for for the last five months, the effect would have been far less profound. As for the NWA itself, losing their champion to somebody positioned as an aggressive rival would have been a wound that didn't heal easily, to say the least. Though the offer was substantial, and Race at 40 years of age was in his twilight as a main eventer, he turned down McMahon's offer. As the story goes, the meeting between the two had been very cordial, and Race's refusal of McMahon's offer was firm but polite. Some versions of the story claim that both men went to use the bathroom at the same time, and there, Race used the lavatory mirror to illustrate his point of view. When Race asked Vince what he saw in the mirror, McMahon said that he saw Race's reflection. The NWA champion then responded that tomorrow morning, he was going to have to get up and look at the same reflection, which told McMahon all he needed to know about Harley Race's principles. Race also reasoned that he couldn't turn his back on the men who allowed him to be a world champion seven times to that point, nor his business partners in the Kansas City and St. Louis territories. While most accounts of the meeting claim that Race and McMahon had been nothing but respectful to one another, there's another version that paints things in a bit of a different light. Meltzer would write in a 2019 obituary of Race, Whether true or not, Race claimed that after he turned McMahon down in a meeting inside a public bathroom, that McMahon was so furious, he attacked him from behind. Race claimed that he shortly reversed things and it ended very quickly. Once McMahon became so powerful and nobody wanted to say anything about him that might make him mad, since people were always looking for that last paycheck, Race stopped telling that part of the story, although when asked, he would never deny the story either. Subsequently, Race did what was expected of him, traveling to Greensboro to put over Flair in the title bout. Flair contends that the world champion didn't arrive until 5 o'clock in the afternoon on show day, and that there was a palpable nervousness in the locker room until he turned up. Whether it's because his meeting with Vince in New York was well known isn't clear. Flair also adds that Crockett footed Race an extra 25 grand for doing the favor, which Flair doesn't begrudge Race for taking. As Flair later wrote, he ended up with an extra 25 grand, and he was still Harley Race. The two went on to have a battle for the ages, which Race feels was only hampered by the clumsiness and poor positioning of referee Kaniski. In the end, the bloody encounter concluded with the 34-year-old challenger catching Race with the diving body press to win his second world title. The finish concluded a night of babyfaces going over in all of the marquee matches, beginning the Starcade chronology on a high note. With over 15,000 fans accounting for a $500,000 gate in Greensboro, and almost half a million in receipts from the closed-circuit viewings, Starcade 1983 couldn't be considered anything but a rousing success. With Flair now on top of the territory, Race bowed out of the Carolinas. He remained active throughout 1984, though many of his matches came in territories closer to home. Race reigned one more time as NWA World Champion, but most fans never saw this title win. He defeated Flair for the gold in New Zealand in March of 1984 before ceding it back to Flair three nights later in Singapore. Neither title change was formally acknowledged until some time later, but it works to assert the long-standing claim that Race is indeed an eight-time NWA World Champion. Two years later, Race did wind up joining the WWF. Now 43, he took on the gimmick of purple-clad nobility, becoming the King Harley Race. Though not Race's greatest run in the sport, his WWF run was still rather prolific, working with the likes of the Junkyard Dog, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and world champion Hulk Hogan before leaving in early 1989. After a brief run in the now Ted Turner-owned WCW, Race wrestled his final match in 1990. He believes his refusal to take Vince's offer, while displeasing to McMahon at the time, actually put himself into a good standing with the WWF boss, later saying, Over the whole thing, I think it gave him a lot more respect for me as a person. Not in the ring, but just as a person. He knew he could trust me, and he knew that even if we were doing this with his organization, I was not going to double-cross the people that had put all of this trust in me. Though the two sometimes found themselves at odds in a highly contentious business, the respect between Vince McMahon and Harley Race was quite apparent. 
Shortly before Racer's death in 2019 at the age of 76, the ailing legend was in a hospital in Atlanta, and he needed to be transferred via med flight back to St. Louis. However, Medicare didn't cover the costs of the trip. According to race protege Trevor Murdoch, McMahon stepped in and paid for the flight in full to ensure that Race made it home shortly before he passed. At the time of Harley Racer's death, the word respect appeared in an innumerable amount of tributes. His decades of service to the professional wrestling industry, his rare toughness, and his unwavering integrity were fondly recalled by peers, promoters, students, and fans alike. Finding an individual who doesn't respect Harley Race would be harder than finding a thousand that do. A story like the Starcade 1983 dilemma seems to best personify Harley Race as a man who gave his word and then kept it. But just how different would things have been if Race had said yes? Does the perception of him and his storied legacy change? Does Flair's career pan out the same way without that signature win? What would Crockett and the NWA do to rectify the title situation? How do Crockett and the NWA recover from losing their world champion to their competitor? Do they recover? The professional wrestling industry may have turned out much different over the near four decades that follows, because that's a lot of tantalizing what-ifs for a single business meeting.